my guest today is Diane Goldstein. Do you do you go by the Lieutenant Commander? Yeah, you can. You know what? That's what I formerly was. Now, um, you know, I'm a executive board member. Um, we continue to use that as so people understand that many of our board member and our speakers come with some significant professional experience. And what does Law Enforcement Action Partnership do? So we are a 501c3 um, nonprofit, and um, it, we were founded in 2002 under uh, a different name, which was Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, which was a uh, educational nonprofit organization that was founded by five police officers, one active duty Canadian, four retired Americans, who all felt that the drug war was in fact an abject failure. We are now not just about educating the public around the issues of, of the drug war, but we're adopted total criminal justice reform that we feel has been significantly impacted by uh, the enforcement of our drug laws. So what's the latest? Uh, let's just start with what the latest is between recreational versus medical marijuana and what the status is among the different states. Um, so it's so interesting because, um, you know, from an educational standpoint, Aaron, and I think this is really critical so people understand. It's not that we're stating that marijuana should be um, – regulated like alcohol, because I think it's much different than alcohol in, in um, many large ways. But we don't like to use the term recreational because one of the things that we recognize is we don't want our kids to use either alcohol, tobacco, or marijuana, or other drugs recreationally. So when we start talking about the idea of marijuana, it's for adult consumption for 21 and over. And then you have the differences with the medical marijuana where you can have children who are patients and are benefiting. Very specifically, we've seen it successfully used for epilepsy amongst kids, for some autism strains and for things like cancer. And so, you know, I, I think like everything else is we just need to really focus on there's going to be two different markets, in particular in California. We're not just going to roll medical into the adult consumption. You're going to have a medical side that is going to have their set of rules and regulations that are probably going to be slightly different, not much, than the adult consumption, which will be the 21 and over market. And for the medical area, we're not just talking about um, THC or cannabis with THC or edibles versus smoking, right? There are uh, other chemicals within uh, cannabis from cannabis that can be extracted from it that have uses that won't make people high, but might help treat various ailments. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, is, is when you start talking medical is one of the things that we've recognized is that we have not, at least in the United States, other countries have done much better research because their government actually allows them to do evidence-based and science-based science, science -based research, unlike ours in some ways. Um, but there, there's THCA, there's CBD, there are uh, dozens and dozens of cannabinoids that haven't really even been researched yet that we know down the road as we open up the science that there's going to be tons of benefits. I think what a lot of people don't understand is from our, physio uh, from our physiology is that we have an, our own uh, endocannabinoid system. You know, it, and so it is that, that certain forms of uh, medical marijuana, in fact, go very well with endocannabinoid deficiencies. You know, I think one of the things that people don't understand is, is one of the biggest issues right now is the industrial hemp market. 
you know, from a economic standard is if we simply allowed every state to legally process industrial hemp, and it's starting to happen right now, but we need to reduce the federal regulations even more because right now um, the only places where industrial hemp is allowed are places that have a number one voted it in, but like in Kentucky is they're experimenting with industrial hemp, but it has to be done under academic purview and for science, and there's all these very uh, you know, heavy regulations that don't make it a viable industry at this point. So even making rope, making hemp rope or clothing. Correct. I, I didn't know that even that was banned. Can you import it? Can you import the materials? Correct. You can. And we do. Okay. But again, the issue goes back to at what cost, you know, is um, the United States for, for, you know, a hundred plus years, uh, even even up into World War II, we were allowing industrial hemp. There was a, a campaign during World War II called Hemp for Victory. And as soon as World War II ended, the federal government went back to making it illegal because it no longer served their purpose. And you mentioned science and studies. Who's doing the studies now what's the status of research well the holdup is is by law the national institution for for drug abuse and and there's there's the key word right there drug abuse it, and so there's a congressional law that basically state that no federal tax money can be used to investigate the efficacy of any schedule one drug and so the vicious circle becomes, and this is uh, being debated a lot right now, both in Congress and, and in different state capitals, is that what came first, the chicken or the egg, you know, is if we would have allowed true traditional scientific research, then we probably would be light years ahead relative to understanding the, the pros and the cons of medical marijuana and how to effectively use it without it being kind of a pharmaceutical type of, of market. And, and, but it's not just in the United States. What most people don't understand is NIDA um, also funds 90% of the research in the whole entire world. So we are using U.S. tax dollars to fund research outside of our country that only supports our prohibitionist agenda. So it all starts with classifying marijuana as a Schedule One drug. And that, correct. And that leads to all of the other regulations. That's correct. And we know, you know, back in the 1970s when Nixon did his um, war on drugs is we now know because of the release of the Nixon tapes and, and because of, of many journalists who've done the research is that the war on drugs was done based on a political ideology. It had nothing to do with the danger of marijuana. It, it was all about getting Nixon elected. And um, one of the things that happened at that time though, which was interesting is Nixon um, established the Schaefer Commission, appointed the Schaefer Commission that was made up of Republicans, researchers, law enforcement, uh, medical providers, who all came to the conclusion after doing tons and tons of testimony and investigation in a very detailed report, they came out and said, neither the marijuana user nor marijuana itself is a danger to public safety or to the marijuana user specifically and should not be classified as a Schedule One drug. And Nixon ignored it based on political purposes. Well, and so here we are almost 50 years later, a trillion and a half dollars spent on a failed war on drugs. How many states or, or what's the movement? Some states, you know, for adult usage, 
fewer for just general adult usage than for medical purposes. So as of today, West Virginia just, um, through their Senate, um, passed medical marijuana regulations that is likely to be signed by their governor. And if that's the case, then you'll have 30 states that are either medical marijuana, medical marijuana, and adult cons- uh, or and or adult consumption. And so we have, I think, with this last year's election, we have uh, six, seven, seven or eight states. Let's see: Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Alaska, California, Massachusetts. Uh, District of Columbia, and I think I'm missing, I'm missing one other state. I can't remember which one, but but we have like at least seven adult consumption states, and um, and within those adult consumption states, we also have um, you know every one of those are medical marijuana, and if West Virginia passes, we have 30 states who have basically invoked the 10th Amendment to develop their own drug policy. And so I think what you're going to see down the road, Aaron, is that that marijuana prohibition in particular is going to fall just like alcohol prohibition did. And it's a state-by-state basis because what is going to happen is we know that the federal government doesn't have the resources to investigate and disrupt every single state's industry, that they have to somehow co-opt state, local law enforcement do so, and the states are pushing back on it. And, and so, you know, it, it this, this week, four governors sent uh, the Trump administration a letter that basically said is, um, please continue uh, with the Cole memo, which was the memo that was designed by um, one of the attorney generals, uh, he's a dec- C-O-L-E? Yeah, yeah, Cole, C-O-L-E. So the Cole memo several years ago lined up um, that the Obama administration would not come in and enforce medical or adult consumption rules as long as the states abided with certain premises, which was to, you know, um, try to prevent kids from getting it, is to make sure that control and regulation prevented excessive leakage where people were shipping legal marijuana out to other states. And so there were some some real significant provisions that most of the states, uh, well, in fact, all of the states have adopted. Uh, If you look at Proposition 64, um, I think in in one of the first paragraphs, it talked about the Cole Memo and how this would support ensuring that medical or that adult consumption marijuana was was passed in a responsible fashion to not violate federal rules and do the individual states have their own regulations regarding quality standards or is it kind of a so it's not a free-for-all it's not a free-for-all but so you know in, in most states i mean i think um one of the things that you're seeing now is because States have uh, instituted, you know, patient or, or, or uh, consumption protections, consumer protections, as you're now seeing pesticide recalls. You're seeing a lot of different uh, regulations that are starting to take effect. And so consumers know, you know, it is, is uh, in, in Colorado and I believe in Washington, they had a little bit of a breakout in, in some pesticide issues. And you know, they, the consumers were fully aware, there were recalls. And so we know that control and regulation makes people safer. The issue is, is we don't want to over-regulate because by, by over-regulation, uh, too many taxes, too many regulations, it also props up the illicit market, which is what we're trying to tamp down as well. California is getting set to roll out. They're going to roll out their medical marijuana provisions first, and then they're going to roll out the adult consumption provisions. But within all those provisions, you're going to have, you know, um, the way products could be advertised, strength, 
you know, that everything needs to be labeled properly is labs are going to have to test. I mean, there's, so it's going to be treated, I think, like a nutraceutical, not like a, a heavy duty pharmaceutical drug, but a little bit different than agriculture. Are the towns within these states having to deal with new problems? Do do some towns object to the legalization and are, are they fighting back against the state the same way that states are pushing back against the federal government? Well, you know, in particular, I can talk about California and both the California medical marijuana regulations and the provisions of Proposition 64, which was the Adult Use uh, Marijuana Act, um, requires some form of dual licensing. So um, for medical marijuana, before you are given a license to operate in, a, in the state, you must be given a business license by the city or the, or, or, you know, the county where you're going to operate. For adult consumption, it's the other way around, is you can apply for a license at the state, and then you can go to a city and see if you can open up shop, but you can't open up shop without a local license as well. So right now we have... Um, what many are calling Banapalooza, which since Proposition 64, you've had a lot of cities and counties that are drafting bans or over-regulating, which are going to be kind of like promoting de facto bans uh, because they don't know what to do with it. And uh, so one of the things that's going to happen, interesting from a legal perspective, is um, I know that uh, a couple cities in the Inland Empire – have, are creating de facto bans which go against the intent of Proposition 64. For example, is one of the cities is saying that in order to be able to, to grow marijuana plants, which is allowed by law in Proposition 64, that you can grow up to six plants and a city or county can sensibly regulate it, and determine, you know, it, whether or not you can grow outside or if it has to be indoors. But they're telling people that in order to get a permit to cultivate according to 64 for personal use, that they're going to have to um, have a criminal background and have their fingerprints run. And so you're going to see lawsuits that are going to push back against cities who are doing regulations such as that. That's on a local level as well. That, that, that's, on a, that's on a local level, you know, and, and that's totally separate than civil asset forfeiture. That basically what they're doing is they're undermining the, the successful implementation of 64 because in Proposition 64, it allows personal home growth. No different than if you wanted to grow a limited amount of, of grapes in your backyard to make your own wine. And so that's, you know, I think that's where we're going to see like the real fights that are going to happen is that you have attorneys groups that are basically now finding, so to speak, victims who just want to grow one or two marijuana plants at home for their own personal use, no different than you wanting to brew a six pack of beer. And so from a liberty standpoint, should government be that involved in our personal lives? And I would say no. Is there a going to be a difference between the Trump administration enforcement and the Obama administration enforcement? We don't know yet. And I think that's part of the problem, you know, is I think that the, the difficulty with um, this administration has been the, the heavy rhetoric coming out relative to law and order. If you look at, you know, one of his recent executive orders that he signed on um, ensuring that uh, the DEA and, and, and law enforcement is funded so they can, you know, push back against transnational crime and we're going to erect a wall and it's going to stop cartels from bringing in illicit drugs into our country, is they're basically just ramping up a 1980s drug war paradigm that hasn't worked. 
Now, the good news is, you know, in Congress, there was just an oversight hearing this week that Chuck Rosenberg, who um, used to be the uh, FBI agents, now a head of the DEA, is, was taken a task by um, the oversight committee for the issues around the issue of industrial hemp. Uh, one, I can't remember which senator, senator it was, uh, basically chided him because the DEA budget is now astronomical and they've added tons and tons of employees. And he specifically said, you have all this money, all these resources, yet our substance abuse in our country is, is at an all-time high. So whatever you're doing, it's not effective. So, I, you know, the, the, the good news is, you know, in the congressional level, we have a cannabis caucus now. You know, it, it's so these are congressmen and women and our representatives who feel that when it comes to the issues of medical marijuana and adult consumption marijuana is that we need to roll back the congressional laws. And so um, this year there's a, um, a slate of bills which includes removing marijuana off Schedule 1 is respecting states' rights to control and regulate both medical marijuana and adult consumption as they see fit, is there's, uh, there's riders that prevent money going to the DEA to fund um, federal drug enforcement in states where both medical marijuana and adult use it has been sanctioned. And so, you know, it's changed and it's continuing to change. And, and in Texas, for example, is uh, we have a, a, a representative by the name of Beto O'Rourke, who is an elected uh, member of Congress, young, and he is a Democrat, and he is basically going to run against Ted Cruz. And he did a speech this last week to announce his campaign, and one of his tenets is about blowing up the war on marijuana. And, you know, so so here, you know, even when I started doing work in, in 2010 on this issue is politicians would never publicly say that, yes, the drug war is a failure. And yes, that they supported adult medical marijuana state laws. And now they're coming out of the woodwork. Who's making money on on marijuana these days? The, the government is making money by using civil forfeiture. Um, some government, and then when I say the government, that's on on both a state level and a federal level that they're, they've been abusing the civil forfeiture laws, right? Sure. Oh, well, yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd say who's making money right now if if uh, marijuana continues to remain illegal? Well, the cops and illegal. The, but, 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 he, but it, the cops and the crooks are. Okay, on, on, yeah. if it's illegal. It's yeah, but yeah, but 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 even you know the federal government, even though we have state compliant laws, uh, you know, even even though we have a a you know future licensed and regulated market, the state could come in and try to undermine it, and they could try to do it by taking people's assets because marijuana is still a Schedule One drug. It'd be harder for them to do it, you know, and I think it'd be a significant black eye. But, you know, the, the continued um, scheduling of marijuana as a Schedule One drug makes it much easier for government to take people's assets. And as Period, a, simple, end of story. As a Schedule One drug, uh, the federal government can still enforce. Even, even if a state says we're not going to enforce, federal government certainly can come in and, and crack down. Well, they could, but, but I think, you know, I think that the difficulty is, is there's going to be some significant blowback if they do. I mean, we, we saw this is, you know, quite a few years back is when Oaksterdam was raided in, in Oakland, when the IRS and the marshals came in and it was a raid over money and not over marijuana and, and taxes. And, it literally started a um, massive protest up in Oakland. 
And the resources that Oakland PD then had to send to kind of deal with this massive protest over the federal government, at the same time when the federal government is in there raiding, you know, a local state compliant business, is there was a massive shooting at a private Christian college in Oakland where an active shooter killed several people. And so one of the things that's happening in California right now is, is um, as I jokingly like to, to say, is that the Democrats have found the Tenth Amendment. And Reggie Jones-Sawyer and Rob Bonta and several other uh, Democrats who've been working on the rollout of medical marijuana, who've, who've designed some pretty good bills in the last couple years, and um, they have a bill going through the assembly called AB 1578, which is a non-intervention bill that basically says we can't stop the federal government from coming into the states and enforcing federal law, but we're not going to allow our state and local law enforcement to help them and waste our fiscal resources to do the federal government's job. And the only way we're going to cooperate is it's to protect state compliant and licensed business. It's not to protect illicit grows in, you know, state parks or federal parks. It's not to protect operators who are diverting drugs out of state. It's, it's to protect state compliant licensed member of the industry that if the federal government, let's say calls, Redondo Beach Police Department, where I used to work, and says, hey, we're investigating this person or this agency, uh, this, this shop that's operating in your city, what can you tell us? We would have to say, sorry, we can't tell you anything unless you come back with a warrant. So back to who's making money. Has the money shifted from the underground economy, the cartels, that may have been smuggling in marijuana to legal businesses and entrepreneurs. What's going on on a on an industry level with the, well, with the business? There's, I think, there's two things. Is that uh, is what control and regulation is going to do is bring out the gray market. And so I think that there's been a lot of misinformation. For example, is you know we know that cartels are growing in illegally in like our state national parks, but they're not taking that product and selling it to dispensaries. They're taking that product and they're shipping it out of state or they're actually smuggling uh, marijuana back to Mexico now because the quality is better. And so um, from the industry perspective, what control and regulation is hoping to do is is get those gray market growers that are operating at, who are maybe not licensed, but they're paying their payroll taxes and their federal taxes, and uh, you know they're they're trying to be good environmental stewards and everything else. They just haven't been issued a proper license yet because we had no regulations. So, um, you know, the, the concerns relative to Proposition 64, the big fight was, you know, are we uh, bringing big marijuana into the industry in order to uh, be able to really allow it to grow? And the way Proposition 64 was set up is there's many tiers of licensing, including micro licensing that is set up to promote small craft farmers, just like we promote small craft brewers or small wineries. And so we don't have to, you know, let a big corporation come in to grow marijuana. We can try to ensure that it's done in an environmental, sustainable fashion that supports small and medium-sized businesses. And that is where the local governments and local regulation would, would come in and correct. Work. And um, so if people want to learn more about this, should they go to law enforcement action partnership.org? Is that a good resource for them? Are there? Well, they, yeah. So we do very kind of broad criminal justice. So law enforcement action partnership 
really mm-hmm. talks about the work our organization's doing, not just on the issues of marijuana across the states, because that's only one small part of what we do. We do reforming civil asset forfeiture, police reform, body cameras, mass incarceration, harm reduction. And so with, with our underlying focus being that the drug war is we can tie just about every bad governmental outcome, whether it's education or higher education or public health strategies or mental health strategies to um, government investing in one tool, which is the criminalization of the public to try to end illicit drug use instead of looking at it from a holistic standpoint. But there's, if you're looking for just cannabis related information is marijuana policy project, um, normal, um, Americans for safe access is the leading medical marijuana, uh, information and resource, uh, in California, California normal does a lot of work in the capital, a lot of educational based work. Um, and they're there to, um, normals there to protect the consumer. And so you have a lot of, uh, organizations that have, um, come up based on kind of their specialty marijuana policy project does, um, uh, legislation and ballot initiatives. So, it, you know, it's kind of, there's, there's a lot of broad different coalitions that we work with on a, on a day-to-day basis.